imagine cycling grass legume mixtures. Huh? Uh, what should we care about this? Those are the main two things. Uh, Margin fertilizer cost. I know it's been going down. The, this is up to 21. I know it's been down a little bit, but it's still above the historical average. So it's still way up there. Nitrogen cost. And we all know that grass needs nitrogen to grow. That's not that's not a new thing, but uh, the, the problem is the cost of the fertilizer. So what can we do to um, reduce our dependence on those fertilizers? That's the number one. Another thing, and Nicholas was talking about that, is there also the high feeding cost, the high uh, cost of uh, protein supplementation. Whoever is, is buying some um, protein, you know, soybean or, or cotton seed whole or whatever, it's, it's pretty expensive. So two things that legumes can help us, reduce our dependence on, on nitrogen fertilizer and to uh, reduce the cost uh, of feeding because of the high protein value of the legumes. Uh, so the goal is really to produce more per unit of nitrogen input that you have in the system. That's really the goal, since nitrogen is, is really one of the big costs. And, uh, and also legumes can also help besides, you know, reducing uh, nitrogen fertilizer cost and uh, improving nutrition can help with other ecosystem services. We have some uh, data from all the group uh, here from Florida showing and, and, and other colleagues from other states as well showing that legumes can also improve habitat for uh, pollinators, you know, reduce leaching and all of that. So you also reduce some environmental problems. I want to thank uh, Roger Trump for putting together this figure. I know you went back and forth, right, Roger, on that. And I, I just want to, uh, to remind you there is a lot of nitrogen in the air. 78% of whatever we, we breathe is, is nitrogen, but it's not available to the plants. So there are basically two ways to put down. One is through the industry, burning fossil fuels and manufacturing nitrogen fertilizer. The other one, legumes can associate with uh, soil mic micro microorganisms and then uh, fix that nitrogen to become available to the plant. But in this cycle of nitrogen, uh, you can see there are many things that you can try to improve. For example, the fertilizer itself, the right rate at the right time, uh, you know, the type of fertilizer is low release fertilizers, for example, can save you some money in terms of less losses. Uh, so that's something to improve right here. Another thing is biological nitrogen fixation. If you add some legumes, then you can you know, improve that uh, input of nitrogen uh, for a, a given uh, price. Also the, the litter, you know, there are two ways of this forage here. One is the cow is gonna eat and return that through the soil via animal excreta, you know, dung and urine. Whatever the cow doesn't eat comes back through litter. But the fact is, most of the nitrogen in a grazing system goes back to the soil. 80 to 90% goes back. There are some losses on that. And then you can also um, improve, for example, the litter from legumes. Uh, it's, it has a better quality, it decays faster. And if that, it provides that nitrogen back to regrow again, compared to bahia grass litter, for example, that is very low uh, quality. We can also improve, for example, the distribution of feces and urine by managing better the pasture, the rotation of stocking, for example, uh, could potentially improve that. And, uh, and there are ways also to reduce nitrogen leaching, and we're going to talk about some of those things today. So the fact is there are inputs and outputs and transformations in the system, and, and it's really important, the, the concept. Uh, the cows, they are not improving the fertility. They're, they're just returning back whatever they they took from, from, from the plants, right? So they're not improving. Some, some people have the misconcept that cows improve the fertility, but it's much better than a hay system where you remove all of those nutrients to another place, and then you need to put everything back. The cows are putting most of that back, uh, and they do a good job doing that. So uh, that's why grazing systems are in the long run uh, more sustainable in terms of that. So biological nitrogen fixation, that's key. Uh, that's one of the main things, right, to um, add more nitrogen to the system. And I, I borrowed that uh, figure from uh, Luana, one of uh, the students, one is in her PhD now, but more legumes, more biological nitrogen fixation. That's simple like that, right? And that's a uh, rhizome perennial peanut that she collected across different places in, in Florida. 
and uh, you know how much nitrogen the legumes can put can fix. Or it depends on how much legumes you have in your pasture. If you have, you know, five percent of legumes, not going to do much. But if you have thirty percent, forty percent, then you're going to have much more nitrogen. So that's key. This was uh, I, I keep repeating this that uh, this picture because I, I did that when once I got here though maybe back in 2014. That's what you get if you plant an array grass without nitrogen fertilizer. Very sorry stand. Bad, right? That's here, Mariana. Uh, same ray grass, uh, but planted with crimson clover. I did not put nitrogen here. It was the same ray grass with crimson clover. And that's with a bursting clover. That tells a lot, right? It's, it's better than a, than a lot of numbers that I show you. It was planted at the same time. Planted at the same time, yes. And those are the numbers for that picture. Uh, well, like uh, Dr. Dillon was saying, crimson clover is really the champion for us here. And it was in this trial as well. So right, right grass and crimson clover, uh, you know, that's uh, 4,000 uh, pounds to the acre. That's the clover biomass production and the right grass biomass production. If you separate, you know, clover and right grass biomass, that's how much we got. Uh, and it's interesting to see that the rye grass also benefit a lot from the clover. That's the rye grass without nitrogen right here. And that's the rye grass growing with the crimson clover. And that's just rye grass biomass, more than double. So that's very unique. And this was not under grazing. So it was kind of, you know, it was a small plot trial. So something is going below ground as well. Uh, and uh, we have some further data that it, we, we can see that. So how much, you know, the clovers are helping in terms of nitrogen fixation? That's one question, right? Uh, and that's uh, some numbers from that same trial that you saw the picture. It's around 40 to 50 uh, pounds to the acre uh, of nitrogen. And this is just above ground. And uh, we don't have the data for below ground. You're gonna have some data for below ground soon. Some of these students are doing the the root below ground turnover and try to see the contribution of that to the system. Uh, and, and it could be significant, but just the above ground is that. And uh, I'm gonna pay attention to those numbers because I'm gonna um, make the argument that uh, for every unit of nitrogen that you put through nitrogen fixation uh, with legumes is at least two, you know, for every pound of nitrogen fixed is at least two pounds of nitrogen that you put um, through a fertilizer application because of the efficiency of the nitrogen cycling with the legume systems. So I have, uh, Dr. Vendramini showed some numbers. I just wanted to show some numbers here for, I think he, he actually sent, uh, showed these numbers around 30 to 40 pounds of nitrogen for Sahem. And that's again, just above ground. So the below, below ground, you're not considering that, but uh, in, in a number of species, it's important. There's a lot of uh, below ground biomass that is gonna turn over uh, and, and also provide some nitrogen to the system. How about perennial peanuts? Um, these are huge numbers, but these are solid perennial peanut field. This is not perennial peanut in, in a grazing condition. So that's 100% perennial peanut in a, in a botanical composition. So it, it's a lot. Uh, so, you know, the best varieties are more than 2,000, uh, 200, I'm sorry, 200 pounds of nitrogen per, per acre per year. That's huge, huge. We didn't put any nitrogen in these fields and we harvest a lot of biomass and did, you know, isotope composition, now that's to measure the nitrogen fixation. So I believe those numbers are right and we repeated through two years. But if you only have like 30% or 20% of uh, perennial peanuts in your botanical composition, then you should expect, you know, 20, 30% or maybe a little, you know, a little more than that, you know, 40 pounds per acre would be something to expect. And then uh, we have the internal recycling. Right? A lot of our roots, they, they turn over and they provide nitrogen to the system. Uh, for example, uh, the perennial peanut root biomass is, is huge. It's huge. Uh, that's uh, 20, around 20,000 pounds of uh, um, organic matter per acre here. And the roots of uh, roots and rhizomes of perennial peanut, they have a pretty good concentration of nitrogen. So when you multiply this number by this number, you get this number here, which the amount of nitrogen that is in that pool below ground. 
I'm not saying that this is available to the plant, but some of that will recycle back every year. Some of that will turn over. And you're trying to understand how much of this pool could become potentially available uh, for the, the system as well. Uh, so Eric uh, Santos, a former student, he did a lot of work on that. And we did you know, those little cages with perennial peanut roots to see the ingrowth and also sample the, the biomass, the root biomass at a given point. And if that, we could um, calculate how much would be the contribution of perennial peanut below ground uh, decay uh, tissues. And, uh, and it really depends on how much perennial peanut, again, you have in your pasture. If assuming this 30% rhizoma peanut in the botanical composition, the root below ground biomass is helping with around 20 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year. So all those things sum up, you know, the, the below ground, the above ground, the nitrogen cycling through screeter, uh, all adds up and, and at the end it's, it's, it's a very efficient system. Let's talk a little bit about the, the litter. <laughs> Uh, so, like I said, uh, whenever, uh, for example, bahia grass litter is hard to decay, it's hard to decompose compared to a legume litter, because legume litter has more nitrogen on it. So it's easier for the microbes or microbes to decay that litter from legume. And that nitrogen that is in the litter will become available to the plant later. So the faster it decays, the better, because that nitrogen cycles back fast, faster to the system. Dr. Sonnenberger, a former student, uh, Marta, she did some nice work on, on um, legume litter, and she uh, played with like different proportions of uh, legume uh, in in the you know, small little litter bag, uh, with you know nylon little bag, litter bag, and the more legumes you see, that's uh, the um, uh, more uh, nitrogen decayed over time. Uh, you know that's the proportion of legumes, and that's. Uh, the remaining nitrogen uh, in, in the bag. So the more legumes, the faster was the decay, and the, the, the greater was the, the release of, of nitrogen in that study. And, uh, and when you oversee your Bahia grass with uh, legumes uh, in, the, in the cool season, you also have a fluctuation of what type of litter you have in the grazing uh, system. Uh, uh, David Haramillo did some work on that, and for example, uh, in May, June, July, you see more carbon from the cool season and from the legumes as well uh, present in the litter. So showing that the, the legumes from the cool season, they are important to provide nitrogen to some degree in, during the summer as well, as the litter is, as the, you know, those annual legumes and annual also cool season grasses, they decay uh, during this time of the, the year since they, they're kind of uh, unknown species. And then as you move forward toward the end of the summer, getting to the fall, then less and less uh, litter comes from, from those C3 species, from legumes and, and C3 grasses. And you see more and more litter from the Bahia grass, for example. So overall, David uh, saw that, uh, you know, the average contribution of the litter component going back to the nitrogen cycle was 42 pounds of nitrogen to the acre. Uh, there was not really a, a whole lot of difference between the system. It was around 42 pounds. So when you put together the, the litter, the below ground, and the dung and, and urine that is cycling back, cycling back in that system, that's all nitrogen that is helping to, to make the grass grow, right? Um, and some people ask, how, how does the grass transfer the nitrogen to, or how does the legume transfer the nitrogen to the grass? Well, they count, graze the legumes and, and put back the nitrogen to the system. The grass is benefiting from that, right? Also the, the decay below ground in several other ways. So that's, let's get a little dirty, dirtier now on, on the dung and urine. Uh, they are very important, you know, uh, ways to return. The, the urine is, is rich in nitrogen and, and the dung as well. Uh, there are a lot of losses and you're measuring some of those losses uh, when it goes back at, again, it, 80 to 90% goes back to the system, but whenever it goes back, there are losses. So we are trying to understand how much of those are, are lost. Uh, and again, uh, if you improve the spatial distribution of uh, dung and urine, uh, you also improve the overall fertility of the system. <laughs> Lisa Garcia, I think Lisa left, but oh, Lisa is back there. She did a very nice work uh, on trying to understand 
how much nitrogen goes back through the dung and through the urine in different systems. I will briefly describe the systems. Um, grass plus nitrogen. In this system, we are putting 200 pounds of nitrogen per year, 100 during the summer, split in two applications of 50 each, and 100 during the winter, 30 at the beginning to help the cool season uh, grass to start, and 70 later uh, in February or so, uh, with uh, uh, 70, and it was a uh, uh, slow release type of, of fertilizer in this, with this 70 application. But anyhow, we are putting 200. In these other systems, and I'll, I'll, I'll go to this other stream here, which is grass plus clover plus rhizoma perennial peanut, and only uh, 30 pounds of nitrogen per year. No nitrogen during the summer, and only 30 during the early fall to help the, the grasses to, to come. So we also measure nitrogen fixation of clovers and perennial peanut. And at the end here, we have the total nitrogen input through fertilizer and fixation, okay? So those are the numbers, 200 here, around 80 here. So uh, that's the return on, on fecal nitrogen. Uh, here we have a, a bigger stocking rate, so more nitrogen cycle, cycle back through the feces in this system compared to the others. Uh, uh, and the urinary nitrogen, it was about the same, it was not very different from those two extremes here, because here the uh, nitrogen concentration in the forage was greater. Um, at the end is the, the total nitrogen excretion, which is just the sum of the feces and the urine together. And what is uh, interesting to see is this. From the input of 200, only about 40% returned back as excreta here. While here, about 80% returned back. And the leader was not really very different. So that tells me a lot. That tells me that the nitrogen cycling in the, in the grass legume system is way more efficient than in the fertilizer system because there are a lot of losses when you apply the fertilizer. And you're still trying to dig into that. Uh, a lot of uh, ammonia volatilization. Overall, the rule of thumb is 50 to 60% of efficiency, which means if you apply 100 units of nitrogen, you get 60 or 50 because everything else is lost. So what I'm trying to say is that um, you, you, know, you cannot compare 50 units of nitrogen fixation with 50 units of fertilizer, because 50 units of nitrogen fixation is at least two times more value than 50 units of fertilizer because of the better efficiency in terms of nitrogen cycling in the system. So when you do the math, put the seed cost and how much it fixed, don't go like a straight relationship because the biological nitrogen fixation is more efficient. Um, so losses, nitrate leaching, ammonia volatilization, nitrous oxide emissions, we are trying to expose all of those. And, and Roger is, is helping me to put all, all together. So I'm kind of giving him a hard time recently, just going back and forth with those numbers. Uh, Dr. Makoviak, I think Sherry is not here, but uh, she's uh, leading an effort on on nitrate leaching in some of these systems. So we have drain lysimeters trying to measure, capture you know, the water that is leached and the nitrogen concentration in that water. Uh, and that, those are the numbers you know, that we've been talking. A lot of nitrogen goes down the drain. It just is leached. It's really, and, and really depends on, on your management. Like if you apply nitrogen fertilizer and you get a, a big rain you know, the next day, you're gonna lose a lot of that just through leaching. So, uh, but anyhow, we try to do a good management, but even though that's the average uh, amount of nitrogen that we, we lose in the fertilizer system, and we still lose a lot, but uh, we lose at, at least, you know, half of the amount in the grass legume system. So again, more efficient here. We did uh, have, and uh, thanks again, Roger, for putting that together in the last minute, but uh, he's uh, measuring some uh, ammonia volatilization. Uh, from from excreta, from feces, from soil, and from urine. So urine is way more important than feces, and the soil is negligible, you know, very little amount. Uh, but there is also a peak right after the, we apply the urine or the feces on the ground, as you see here. There is a peak, and then after that, those are days. For up, after five, six days, there is not much going on. So we may need to reduce our sampling, right, Roger? 
<laughs> but anyhow, uh, big difference. But again, the ammonia volatilization was a little uh, bigger here in the legume system in this case. But uh, we haven't measured how much is lost through uh, right after applying the fertilizer. That's that's in our to-do list. Uh, we are going to apply fertilizer and try to measure the ammonia uh, that is lost. But the literature say it goes from 10 to 50 percent. So it's it's reasonable to expect to expect at least 25 percent to 30 percent is lost through ammonia volatilization. Um, again, this is uh, uh, how much. What is the percentage of the ammonia volatilization that was lost? It was a little higher in the in the grass uh, legume system in this case. But when you plug this number with uh, Lisa's data on how much nitrogen cycles back to the system in terms of feces and urine, that's how much you lose in terms of ammonia from feces and uh, and urine. So it, it is not a, a, like a very significant amount if you compare to, for example, the fertilizer. Uh, that you're applying and you lose 25 to 30%. So yeah, there's a little more here in the legume side, but the number is not very big compared to what could happen if nitrogen from fertilizer. From N2O, uh, nitrous oxide emission, which is another loss. Uh, I, I borrowed some uh, data again from uh, Martha Coleman, uh, Dr. Sonnenberg student, uh, and she, uh, evaluated how much of the nitrogen that is applied to dung or through urine is lost as nitrous oxide, which is a potent greenhouse gas. Uh, and again, urine is much more important than feces, 10 times more. But when you plug the numbers with Lisa's data again, it's less than a pound per acre. Although nit nitrous oxide is a very potent greenhouse gas, but in terms of nitrogen loss in the cycle, it's not very significant. And I did have some data interesting uh, from a former student, Flavia, where she um, she fed uh, steers with uh, Lispidiza, Cerisia Lispidiza, hay, uh, and replacing um, Bermuda grass, you know, so we have zero Lispidiza, 50% Lispidiza, 100% Lispidiza, uh, and that's uh, nitrous oxide losses. And it was impressive to see that's uh, feces and urine, that uh, as you put more uh, Lispidiza here in the diet, there was a very sharp decline in the nitrous oxide emission, both from uh, the dung, but more especially from the urine. Big reduction here. So that's something that we're still trying to figure out the reasons. We didn't uh, explore a whole lot, you know, the, the urine composition, but there are some theories saying that the, the Lispidiza has condensed tannins, and some products of that condensed tannins can end up in the urine uh, inhibiting uh, nitrous oxide emission. I know you might be puzzled with all that information and numbers, <laughs> but as 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 you put this together, uh, and thanks again, Roger, for for doing that. And you can compare the nitrogen fertilized uh, grass in the grass legume mixture. Uh, again, uh, the inputs here are mainly the nitrogen fertilizer, uh, and so those are some of the numbers that you have. How much is going back through the litter? How much is going back to the feces and urine? How much is going back through the uh, you know, the, the losses through the screener. We still need to add here, we don't have it, the ammonia volatilization from fertilizer. Uh, and on this other side, you have the grass legume mixture. Um, you know, the time is gone, but uh, at the end, I would like you to focus on this table here, especially in the last row. Those are the numbers for those systems. We've been actually, for those of you that are not aware of that system, we've been uh, producing uh, more gain of pretty much similar gains, not really significant, but with a trend of you know being higher here in the grass legume system with only 30 pounds of nitrogen fertilizer plus perennial peanut in the summer and clovers in the winter compared to the grass fertilizer with 200 pounds of nitrogen. And the last row is the gain per pound of nitrogen input, 2.8 and, and here 7.6. So here you're producing almost three times more um, pounds of gain per unit of nitrogen input. So that's why I'm, I keep saying that uh, the efficiency of the uh, nitrogen cycling in the grass legume system is way better uh, than compared to, to the fertilizer system. So just as a take home message, I think uh, 
I'm I'm still a believer, Dr. Sonnenberg, that forage legumes are, are key here to enhance the sustainability of our forage livestock system. We have unique opportunities in this region to grow legumes. Uh, during the cool season, we have beautiful clovers that can grow. I like to blend them, like Leanne mentioned, you have earlier like prints or later like ball or red. You can mix them together to stretch the grazing season. Perennial peanut can help during the summer or others like ash nominee or or any other that was talking today. Uh, and can you know reduce our reliance on nitrogen fertilizer? It can improve the diet of the animals, uh, increase the, the gains, and it, it is good for the environment as well. Less um, nitrate leaching and uh, and less carbon footprint. That's something that Javier is still doing a life cycle assessment, but the trend is uh, the, the much lower carbon footprint in the grass legume systems. I would like to thank the team. Without them, I cannot not do much. The whole team, you know, the whole forage team and, and also the farm crew on the unit and, and all the, the folks here. Thank you.